The following is for informational and entertainment purposes only and should not be construed as financial advice. This discussion is a presentation by 1031, the leading institutional investor focused on the Bitcoin ecosystem. 1031 has over 10 years of experience in Bitcoin and has deployed nearly $150 million into the leading opportunities in the space. To learn more, visit 1031.vc. Bitcoin Alpha Episode 1, Grant John. Let's rip the Band-Aid off. We've been talking about this for a few weeks now. This is Absolutely, let's do it. This is a new show that we're going to do under the 1031 brand. Right now we're thinking bi-weekly every two weeks. We're going to do a check-in uh, and dissect the news, some news headlines of the week, maybe a deal or two that have happened uh, recently and try to put forth the case for Bitcoin for the traditional institutional investor who's wondering what the hell is going on here. We've been talking about this. It seems like we're about to head into another bull cycle. And as waves and waves of new entrants come, we want to make sure that you're getting the best information because you're going to have these questions. And so I'm going to throw it to John now, who is the brains behind this podcast, the man making the list of the topics that we're going to talk about. And I think for the audience, giving a brief intro, how you came to Bitcoin, how you came to 1031, and your overall perspective about what we're doing here. Yeah, for sure. Um, as always, Marty is far too kind. Uh, I do what I can, but uh, these guys are the real rock stars. Uh, I'm just, just happy to be along for the ride. Um, but my background is, for those that don't know me, in primarily from traditional finance. So out of college, started investment banking, went to the buy side after a couple of years, worked at a few hedge funds, including Citadel. And along the way, uh, really fell in the Bitcoin rabbit hole pretty hard. It's a, a story that's becoming more and more common, I think, throughout the world. And, and I was one example of that. Uh, had always been kind of an advocate of and, and interested in Austrian economics, um, you know, the, the history of the gold standard and kind of the U.S. Uh, monetary framework prior to 1971, uh, when we kind of entered this fully uh, unbacked fiat regime that we've been in for about the last 50 years. Um, and when I finally grokked Bitcoin, uh, it, it all clicked for me pretty quickly. And so fell down that rabbit hole pretty hard and spent a few years years, uh, just being yeah, obsessed with it and thinking about uh, not a lot else other than Bitcoin outside my day job and uh, learning a lot from uh, Marty here about how it works and kind of the ecosystem around it. And so uh, in summer kind of 2021 was looking around for ways to invest more in the ecosystem and kind of found these guys, uh, struck up a relationship with them. I saw that they had brought on uh, two kind of guys from traditional finance, one of whom is, is on the call, who we'll introduce uh, in a second, and then uh, Matt Odell and Marty Bent to kind of bridge the uh, the, the, the Bitcoin gap uh, between traditional finance and Bitcoin. And, you know, I knew right away that this was a, a, a special group that could do special things. So reached out, struck up a relationship, and was able to come on full time in summer of 2022. Um, and I think over the, the last couple of years that we've we've been doing this, uh, the the proof has just kind of been in the pudding. It's been a whirlwind. Uh, we've deployed close to 150 million dollars um, over two funds, and you know I think we're we're just getting started. We we've look at everything across uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, technologies, financial services, consumer applications, and that that universe, as we'll we'll get into on this this podcast, is is only expanding, and so couldn't be happier with kind of what we're building here. And I'll I'll kick it over to to Grant, who's one of the co-founders, to, to introduce himself and you know give his vision for you know, what we're doing here and why we think this is this is so exciting, especially for institutional investors and kind of the broader traditional finance world. Sure, absolutely. And the other thing we should point out about John is he is also the creator and author of the 1031 timestamp, which in my opinion is is the best Bitcoin focused newsletter out there on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> and so if you're not a subscriber to that, you should definitely check it out. Uh, I was trying to do some polls around Noster and social media to see what else is out there that really covers the landscape uh, in a way that the timestamp does. And I just think it's unmatched. We do it every Saturday. How long has it been? It's been probably 
over a year, two maybe years two now. years. Yeah, a couple at this years. Point. Uh, and that was sort of a, in part, the inspiration behind this podcast was to cover some of the content that we cover there because it's everything from uh, macro oriented stuff to uh, Bitcoin specific development activity in our portfolio, which is pretty hum- comprehensive uh, in the Bitcoin landscape. Uh, but to bring it back to 1031 and in my background, I come from traditional finance as well. Uh, I out of college, um, I went into investment banking, similar to John. Uh, spent a few years uh, doing that uh, on the leverage finance side with uh, Credit Suisse in both New York and London, and then I moved back from London to New York and joined a private equity firm, one of the largest private equity firms globally, called CVC Capital Partners. Uh, one was one of the the early members of their U.S. team as they were expanding into the U.S. And I was with them for about 15 years um, doing all sorts of um, uh, industry related investing uh, in large cap private equity. Um, there's there's probably not a business model I haven't seen in that time frame uh, was allocating uh, capital at, at a very large scale, the companies that were multi-billion dollar companies and involved in <clears throat> the entire life cycle of a deal from uh, sourcing opportunities to evaluating and diligencing them to establishing uh, relationships with the management teams uh, and the companies trying to advocate for becoming long-term partners of the, with them uh, establishing those partnerships after we made the investment uh, over you know five to ten years, um, sitting on the boards, uh, working with them on value creation plans, and then ultimately driving successful investment returns for our underlying investors. And um, you know to sum it all up, I was just an investor by profession because I love it. <clears throat> but at the same time, for I mean, it's almost going on 10 years now that I've been uh, interested in Bitcoin. First, it was uh, just a side hobby uh, that I was doing uh, alongside of a lot of just angel investing uh, in in technology companies outside of my role um, at CVC. And those two interests of mine, Bitcoin and early stage investing, really came together when we found... Uh, some opportunities to invest in companies in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And it really was just a light bulb moment for me because what I was hearing from some of those early companies that we were meeting, and when I say we, uh, at the time it was um, uh, Jonathan Kirkwood, who's my cousin and another one of the the co-founders of 1031. Um, We were hearing from the Bitcoin founders that uh, they were very much interested in capital partners that were aligned with them on the importance of Bitcoin, uh, how it was going to change the world. And um, there really was a scarcity of capital out there um, that really fit what they were looking for. And we started investing in some of those opportunities and ultimately rolled that into what became our very first fund, um, focus on supporting the ecosystem. And as John said, we've now uh, raised and invested a couple funds um, and uh, are really excited about the momentum that we have. The uh, The premise was just try to um, do the opposite almost of what we had seen in the traditional venture capital world um, and focus on companies that we thought could make a meaningful impact on the build out of the infrastructure um, and advance Bitcoin adoption globally. So. With that, I'll pause and uh, we can uh, take it however you like, Marty. Well, it's going to be a short pause because before we jump into the list of topics we have to cover today, I think it would be great to get your perspective, Grant, on the difference of underwriting deals for this nation industry that we're playing in with Bitcoin versus what you dealt with at CBC. Um, What's that diligence process or your thought process and how has it changed moving from different scales of the market of capital allocation? Well, in many ways, I think that 
it is very similar. And in fact, I've, I've argued in the past that I think just the way that Bitcoin is going to really uh, disrupt um, the investment landscape is that I think just this world of easy money um, is coming to an end. We've started to see that in general over the last several years, just because of uh, the macro backdrop and the situation that um, governments have, have been in and um, the cost of capital changing pretty significantly. Uh, but putting that aside, I think Bitcoin was already poised to um, cause that type of disruption. And so I think that the experience in private equity you know, you can have different flavors of investing. Um, the one that I was was most exposed to was just cash flow oriented investing, where you are uh, underwriting an opportunity based on how do you see the the total addressable market, um, a company's positioning um, within that space, and then ultimately, um, can it uh, produce in a sustainable way cash flows um, uh, through which you can underwrite and drive an investment return over a long period of time. I think that um, a world that's moving towards Bitcoin, that type of underwriting is going to become uh, much more relevant over time than historically what we've become used to over the last uh, couple decades or so is this growth at all cost, easy money world where um, there hasn't historically been as much emphasis, at least earlier on in um, generating sustainable business models and actually trying to generate profits. It's, you know, growth hacking and blitz scaling and all these buzzwords to uh, try to scale to billion dollar valuations without ever having made a dollar. Um, so I do think that the underwriting process uh, going forward looks a lot like uh, what I'm used to in private equity. Um, and with that, um, you know, we've very much been focused at 1031 on what we call SATS flow, which is just the, the equivalent um, thinking around cash flow, just a company being able to generate Bitcoin denominated profits um, that, um, that boost their treasury position over time. SATS flow, it's important. And it's, it's a, a concept that the market has become completely detached from over the last two decades, particularly uh, speci specifically Silicon Valley backed startups that have this growth and all minds growth at all costs mindset. And I think that's core to our thesis here is that um, not only investing in the companies that we are, but Bitcoin first, why does Bitcoin exist? And this is going to segue into our first topic, which is a paper written by the Minneapolis Fed last week that, that highlighted because Bitcoin exists, it is going to make it harder for governments to run deficits the way they have been for, for many decades since we were ripped off the gold standard. And Bitcoin is changing everything. And despite that fact, despite the fact that Bitcoin is approaching a $1.4 trillion market cap, there are a lot of naysayers out there who really don't understand the profundity of Bitcoin existing in the market and competing with these fiat currencies. And I think the, the Minneapolis Fed paper that was written is just a perfect um, personification of the, the, um, the, the lack of awareness that incumbent economists have in this case um, in regards to the fact that the way they're operating the monetary system uh, is is becoming um, very clear to people that it that that is not um, it, it is not working anymore. And Bitcoin provides this alternative to individuals, corporations, uh, governments. And despite that fact, there's been many naysayers for the first 15 years. And this Minneapolis Fed paper was beautiful because they essentially admit that Bitcoin does have a, uh, a place in the world. And if it is successful, it can really perturb the ability for these governments to run deficits. And Grant and I were joking before we hit record here. I think another thing that is hilarious about the paper is that it's essentially an econometrics paper that is just filled with 
economics jargon and calculations that don't really map to reality. So John, what did you think of this paper? Yeah, well, the I mean, the best thing about it to me when I first saw it is it's like, it, you know, it's like Schrodinger's money almost. It's like, so Bitcoin is simultaneously useless. You know, it's explicitly called in this paper useless, it equated to useless pieces of paper, which is ironic given um, the system from which it's, it's the paper is emanating. But so it's simultaneously useless and yet so useful and so desirable as to present a constraint for infinite federal deficits, right? So, and you often kind of see this in, Kind of traditional finance world, people who have you know looked at Bitcoin maybe a little bit, um, they'll kind of simul you know if they haven't really kind of dug in further, they can kind of simultaneously hold this internally incoherent view that Bitcoin is you know worthless and it, you know it's going to zero and also it's going to get banned, right? So it's hard it's hard to see how you could really kind of reconcile those views at the same time. Either it's you know so useful that there would be kind of government action against it or it's you know so useless and you know beyond discussion that tomorrow it's going to go to zero or you know in relatively short order on kind of geopolitical timelines it's going to go to zero. So why are we even talking about it? You know it kind of has to be one or the other you would think. Uh, so this is you know echoing that kind of internal um, illogic and, and incoherence in you know just a really uh, pristine and, and succinct way. So that, that was the first thing that jumped out to me and I think it really says you know it it surprisingly says like the quiet part out loud, right? You, you wouldn't necessarily expect a, a Fed paper to be so kind of intentionally or not self-aware about the nature of the system, which is that it effectively relies on kind of infinite bag holding and, and captive bag holding of US federal debt. Um, and if there is is an alternative uh, that is harder, scarcer, you know, permissionless, uh, decentralized that people can interact with in a variety of ways um, outside of the permissions of a third party, or said another way, outside money, right? Effectively, you know, what gold was uh, 100, 200 years ago, except gold that could be teleported teleported and, and trans transported at the speed of light, um, that people would, would flock to that kind of that kind of admission and um, just awareness that that is necessarily a governor and a constraint on infinite issuance of, of new debt to pile onto the system is is actually something that I haven't really seen in, in print before from a Fed paper or a, a broader kind of central bank paper. So those are the things that stuck out to me, the, the Schrodinger's money piece, simultaneously useless and worthy of, of being banned, and the fact that it kind of implicitly is is admitting that uh, the the system only works if and if and as it can kind of issue infinite new um, you know debt without and, and have like a, a captive audience to to acquire that debt over time. Yeah, yeah it's like they, I, I mean, I agree with those points. And what one of the things that I also thought was interesting was at the same time they were saying that. You know, Bitcoin are these useless pieces of paper. They also they were saying the same thing about dollars as well. They sort of were saying government stock and old dollar bills were also useless pieces of paper. Um, so there were some interesting gems like that that they sprinkled in there. Uh, I think which are more accurate than maybe some of the things that they were saying about Bitcoin. But they also got things about Bitcoin right because I mean one of their I think biggest um, concerns was that it wasn't a claim on anything. You know, they, they sort of said that multiple times that it's not a claim, uh, it's not a liability, uh, which is correct. It is its own bare asset. Um, and, you know, the fact that they want to, they're advocating a, a way to have persistent uh, budget deficits. You know, I was starting to go down this line of thinking of, well, why? Like, what is it? Um, you know, there's a lot of these complicated math formulas when you look in there. And I was an engineer in college and I minored in math. And even some of that, I was just like, you can't, you can't simplify the economy down to an equation and consumer behavior. You cannot simplify it down to an equation. But at the end of the day, I think what it boils down to is, you know, this top down central planning control. They think that if they can run persistent um, government deficits, then they're able to reallocate resources in a way that they wish. They don't think that 
individuals have the ability or um, can stomach the responsibility of doing that themselves, that it needs to be um, government controlled. Yeah, and this is despite a an overwhelming amount of evidence to the contrary. <laughs> the government, uh, I think it's pretty clear at this point, that's why I think this election um, is as vitriolic or contentious as it is, is because we're, we're at this crossroads, particularly in America, where it seems like the government has been overbearing in many facets of our lives and people are clamoring for somebody to come in and make the government smaller. I mean, explicitly the last couple of weeks of the run up to the election, Trump basically uh, putting forth a whole new tax policy, which is high tariffs, um, floating, eliminating the, the income tax and a bunch of other measures that would get uh, the economy or excuse me, the government out of the economy. And um, I mean, part of that tax policy, high tariffs, low income tax implicitly um, alludes to the fact that you're going to have to cut a bunch of government spending um, and cut a bunch of government programs to, to make sure that you can do that in a way in which uh, you, you don't restoke inflation and, and have inflation running particularly hot. Because if you're going to do that tax policy, you're going to need to um, cut spending. If not, if all else held equal, you raise tariffs and lower the income tax. It's going to be pretty inflationary um, for the economy. But going back to the Minneapolis Fed paper and the way they were, I mean, the, the conclusion basically says if we're allowed to make Bitcoin illegal for particular use cases and leverage the asset, you can have budget deficits run hot into perpetuity because we will have the scarce asset that, that enables that. And so it's essentially the conclusion is don't let individuals and companies hold this, figure out a way to silo it into uh, the government treasury uh, so that we can extend the budget deficits and continue to print these dollars um, and issue these treasuries uh, it was actually pretty evil at the end of the day. It's like, we're going to leverage Bitcoin t to run these deficits and expand the monetary base, debasing everybody's purchasing power, but the government will be okay. Um, and the Fed, whether they want to admit it or not, has become highly politicized and they do have an effect on how people view what the government is doing at any given point in time. And they can never come out and admit that um, all, all is lost, uh, even though they may have alluded to it in this paper. They can never come out and starkly say that they uh, exist alongside the Treasury to make sure that we can continue issuing debt. And that is the other big topic uh, of the last week. One of the big topics of the last week is the fact that you have two um, particularly well-respected investors who have cr repeatedly and consistently outperformed the market over the course of many decades. Paul Tudor Jones and Stan Druckenmiller come out within days of each other and say that they think inflation is going to run hot. Because of that, they are very bullish on um, scarce assets like gold, Bitcoin. Paul Tudor Jones said he would also have an allocation to the NASDAQ um, and said, Paul Tudor Jones said he owns no bonds. Stan Druckenmiller uh, said something very similarly, but even took it uh, a degree further, which is admitting that or making people aware that 20% of his portfolio uh, within his family office is short bonds. And so there you have two uh, tenured, very respected um, traders taking a pretty, um, a pretty contrarian position, particularly within the bond markets. John. What do you think about these two making that statement? Yeah, I mean, it gets to, you know, to tie it back to the last topic, um, it, it gets to, at the very least, I think, these three things collectively, so the Fed paper, Paul Tudor Jones's comments, and Stan Druckenmiller's comments, uh, should lead people to ask, um, why is it that Bitcoin would be seen as a potential release valve or a potential alternative that would be attractive in an environment with, uh, you know, parabolically growing deficits? Like the the Fed seems to acknowledge that that is the case, and their reaction to that is very different than Stan Druckenmiller's or Paul Tudor Jones's. But there's kind of 
un underlying all of that is, is this acknowledgement that Bitcoin is this useful alternative. And so I would encourage anyone who is kind of looking at this from just a general mac generalist macro perspective to kind of, if you haven't, can I ask that question, you know, ask that question, why, why is this something that um, a bunch of different parties with different interests are all kind of acknowledging is, is a, a good alternative um, in an environment like this. Um, you know, I think it's, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that there's some some book talking of already like fully sized trades here by um, by both of these guys and and that that's fine. Um, but I think you know whether I, I don't know where they are in the life cycle of of these trades and now that this seems to be kind of the consensus view in a certain corner of of Twitter. You know maybe the tenure is about to to roll over again. But I think the arguments that they're making are are pretty difficult to to kind of counter just looking at the reality of the fiscal situation you know there's 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 some uh kind of pundits out there who might argue and have argued you know over the last few years as this kind of thinking and this kind of argument has gained steam among you know people like paul tudor jones and, and sam druckenmiller you know the counter argument has been well you know all, all we really need to do it's it's we're not that far gone we still have you know the reserve currency we're still the the issuer of the world's reserve currency everything runs on dollar rails and, as, and is dependent on the dollar and so all we need to do is just get our fiscal house in order we need to get tax rates up and and cut spending and you know here here's the math on um if we're just responsible about it here's here's how we can you know get to a, a you know budget surplus or kind of a neutral budget by X year, and I think you know what that that argument is is kind of missing is just there's no practical way that wh wh whether the the math theoretically works or not there's no practical way to get marginal tax rates up to you know levels that we saw in like the 40s and 50s and 60s without you know a, a borderline revolt um and you know from from a, across different segments of different uh you know economic interests uh, I mean, we're talking we're talking 90 percent plus kind of top marginal rates and that's uh not something that's going to be popular um and we're we're in you know a system like it or not that really optimizes for kind of four year election outcomes and that's kind of how we've we've gotten into into this place and so um, that's one element and you know it's also worth remembering that uh, on on the the spending side even outside of um, the budget deficits that we're running up every year even outside of the the stated federal debt that we have you know thirty five thirty six trillion whatever it whatever it is and going up kind of parabolically every month, even outside of that, the, the unfunded liabilities that we have for future generations for Social Security and, and Medicare are uh, you know, multiples of that, right? And so that's that's its own problem that um, still needs to be addressed, even if you could get, you know, jack up marginal tax rates to some crazy level. And even if you could get really aggressive on, on the fiscal side, um, neither of which would be popular and both of which would also tend to push the U.S. further into something that looks more like a recession. Um, so you've kind of got this doom loop where, you know, does that then collapse tax receipts and you actually end up exacerbating the the, the deficit problem. And so um, it, it is whether, it, you know, uh, some resolution of this comes to a head this year, five years from now, 10 years from now, whether Paul Tudor Jones and, and Druck and Miller have their trades fully sized and they're, and they're using, you know, people on Twitter as exit liquidity. Uh, the, the fundamental argument is, is not, it is very difficult to dispute. And I think it's even worse than what Paul Tudor Jones it kind of um, stipulates in, in that video that's been going around of, of him making this case. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's just, something that uh everyone needs to be thinking about um and i think the the only way as as he says to um to get out of of this this problem without significant fiscal and tax pain that is both going to be very unpopular and potentially runs the risk of just you know fanning the flames and, and making making the fire worse is you know fueling nominal growth right um through looser monetary and fiscal policy the the byproduct of which would then likely be more price inflation. Um, that's very likely going to be, I think, in all of our view, the the path that gets chosen. Um, it uh, uh, basically uh, socializes this problem onto you know holders of of the currency, both both domestic and foreign, and um, in a system that optimizes again for kind of four year election outcomes. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's probably going to be, and I think these guys would tend to agree based on their trades. Um, 
where we where we end up going. And so that's the that's the long term path or the you know the medium term path at least for for the bond market and um, assets that are not scarce and they're not hard. And on the flip side, that's why you'd want a significant we think allocation to Bitcoin and companies that are leveraging Bitcoin in different ways and and stacking it on their balance sheet. Yeah, it's uh, and that's like with all that in mind too. Like thinking about like PTJ, Stan Druck and Miller when they're saying Bitcoin, they're thinking Bitcoin, the yes, asset. Obviously, what we're involved in, um, we're here because we we believe Bitcoin is an important tool to counteract these forces that exist within the incumbent central banking system and over and a system filled with overbloated governments that are drunk on spending. Uh, but they view this as an asset. And I think uh, pivoting the conversation, conversation toward what we're here to do, which is the asset sits below everything we do. PTJ and Druck and Miller, when they're talking about Bitcoin, they're thinking about Bitcoin uh, in regards to it being very scarce asset, 21 million. I want to allocate to that um, to make sure I, am hedged against inflation or am just allocated to, to an asset that is completely uncorrelated to anything going on in bond markets or public equities. But the the business that we're involved in is, is understanding the layer above that, which is the companies that are enabling individuals, other companies, governments to onboard um, to Bitcoin. I think that is an area that we would all agree is severely overlooked um, not only by people that um, have identified Bitcoin as an asset they want to have exposure to, but even the people that have, number one, identified that, and then two, identified that maybe having um, exposure to the infrastructure around Bitcoin uh, have missed as well, because most of the capital that has been raised has been deployed towards the broader crypto ecosystem. There's a lot of people we have seen what Bitcoin has brought to the world. They think it's MySpace uh, and they've raised a bunch of money and allocated towards uh, alternative cryptocurrencies and the infrastructure around those. Um, and we exist in a lane that is exclusively focused on Bitcoin and the infrastructure around it. And so Grant, throwing it to you, um, diving deeper into what we do and how our focus is differentiated from um, most of the venture capital or investment platforms focused on this space. And when most people hear the space, they think Bitcoin and broader crypto. Yeah, I think it's just, it's, it's such a surprising phenomenon that there hasn't been that much capital pursuing you know, that basically the strategy that we are that haven't connected the dots that you hear these, um, you know, these great investors, Paul Tudor Jones, Drunken Miller, you see the conclusions that are coming out from these uh, government papers, not just the Minneapolis Fed, the one that the ECB that came out of uh, Europe, you know, ba basically everyone's saying all paths are sort of pointing to Bitcoin to some degree. And not many people have connected the dots that, all right, well, there seems to be this long-term secular growth, this likelihood of continued adoption of the asset. What does that necessarily imply if more people are entering the market to get access to the asset, then it implies that there are going to be providers that make it easier for them to do so, that make it easier for uh, individuals, for institutions, even governments to acquire and qu acquire Bitcoin, to hold Bitcoin, to use it in different ways. Like what we basically say is the enabling infrastructure, the companies that build the enabling technology. And that's what we are 100 percent focused on. We're not we haven't. Um, looked at anything but Bitcoin. And Mari, to your point, most of the capital that latched on to this, this trend of cryptocurrencies has, has looked for the next Bitcoin um, and, you know, sort of either follow a, um, 
you know, a hedge fund type of trading strategy, get early access to tokens that they hope to appreciate very much as sort of speculation play. Um, some of them being, you know, venture oriented strategies as well. But um, our focus has just been on what are the companies that are going to build this enabling infrastructure? How do we get access to the equity of those companies? And how do we help support the growth of, um, of the ecosystem in general that makes it easier for um, users of all types to enter the industry? Um, and ultimately, that's what you know, that's what we want to see is um, it be easier for people to uh, be able to acquire Bitcoin, hold it, use it. Yeah, and I think, Grant, that hits on something that I think is, is worth thinking about as well as, as anyone, you know, looks at the space. You know, the, everything we talked about kind of or for the first 20 minutes related, you know, primarily to kind of a, a defensive posture, right? That the prior system has a lot of issues that will you know, don't have any easy solutions. And, you know, these programs have been set up such that it's very difficult for um, subsequent generations of politicians to, you know, modify them, you know, once they're in place. That was kind of explicitly, you know, the, the idea behind Social Security, for example. Example. And so you need some sort of like defensive answer to that for your portfolio. And that's all very, very true. But I think what you're saying that gets us so excited is so that's that's a huge kind of kickstart motivator for the space. But also we see, you know, opportunities for Bitcoin to also be very offensive and very and have the it has these secular growth characteristics of, OK, well, if that's if this is the case, right, if um, if Bitcoin is a superior store of value in a world that increasingly desperately needs that, you know, what's the implication? of that well it means that the world's you know eight billion people are in some way going to need and going to want to get access to it and then to probably re-denominate more and more of their economic activity in it and leverage its programmability and its native features in different ways and all it is to say if, if bitcoin is is better money then it's going to touch literally every economic interaction uh essentially around around the world right there's no version of commerce at any kind of scale that doesn't require um, and leverage money. And so if, if Bitcoin is is becoming over time, not not tomorrow, not next year, but over decades becoming the world's chosen money, um, then that is outside of kind of the defensive characteristics, a massive secular growth opportunity that so few investors are really even thinking about right now. And the only evidence you need for that, to your point, is the mismatch between capital deployed into kind of the broader crypto space. We estimate that our latest estimates for that are probably north of 25 billion uh, at this point, maybe, maybe much more now. And, you know, by contrast, um, we've we've seen 250 million, 500 million maybe deployed into uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem for technologies that are building out that infrastructure that is is already seeing and is just going to see much more demand over time as these these natural effects kind of take place. And so it's it's not just a defensive story, it's a growth story. And it's it's a growth story that is, you know, 100 to one right now kind of out uh, outmatched in terms of capital raising uh, toward projects that are not going to benefit from that same kind of tailwind and that same kind of dynamic because there's only going to be one money that people want to hold and that's where the TAM is, that's where the opportunity is. And so all that is just to say, yeah, it's defensive. Yeah, we're responding to kind of macro trends that that might be you know frightening or worrisome. But at the same time, it, it's not just a you know hedge against inflation strategy. It's a, it's a pursue um, massive growth strategy as well that a lot of people have not woken up to yet. Yeah, and if you I mean if you want a deep dive on this, uh, talking John's book here, John wrote a great essay called "Bitcoin Is Eating the World," which kind of goes comprehensively into this. It's 1031.vc slash insights slash TAM. Um, and I think, look, one of the things that we say is that like, you meet a lot of uh, people who are bullish on Bitcoin and its potential price appreciation over, you know, various um, you know, links. And what we say is, well, if you think Bitcoin's going up to a million dollars, $10 million, whatever your price target is, it's not going to just do that on its own. It's going to do that um, because of the companies that are building uh, this infrastructure. They, they not only will benefit from the continued growth and adoption, but they will actually enable it. Yeah, that's, I mean, 
having been in this for 11 years, seen, uh, got in 2013, so I saw that cycle going up to like 1200 subsequently falling down to like 150 between 150 and $200, right up to 17K, down to 3000 up to 60K, down to 15 and where we are today, approaching $70,000 leading up to the election. And across that period of time, there have been different waves of crypto fervors, if you will. In the beginning, you had uh, essentially very simple schemes. Oh, we're going to uh, increase Bitcoin supply by 4x and cut down its block time uh, to one fourth Litecoin. And you had proof of stake coins. That was like the 2013, 2014, 15 era. And then Ethereum launching in uh, the tail end of that era really introduced initial coin offerings. And then you fast forward uh, to the last cycle and you had DeFi projects. And now today we have meme coins and Throughout time, and that's why I want to pull up this chart, Logan, you can pull it up. I think it's been interesting. This is not my favorite metric because it can, uh, noise can easily be introduced since this metric is the Bitcoin dominance level. And I think this is really interesting, particularly for where we are right now. It's that despite the fact that you've had these waves and you have thousands more coins entering the total supply, Bitcoin dominance uh, as it stands today for the last year plus, two years, has been has been climbing and i think this is a product of the market becoming more aware that that bitcoin is where the signal's at i think we do have uh, at least a few more cycles for people to really shake out the idea that um, these cryptocurrencies can compete with bitcoin because that's what i think the market is learning historically people have viewed bitcoin and the altcoins that have come in its wake as tech innovations, which to agree a degree, they certainly are. I mean, Bitcoin is a distributed technology project. It's certainly an innovation. What Satoshi released was a breakthrough um, that did not exist before he hit publish on the code. Um, but people have over-indexed the tech side of it and really think of what we're witnessing as tech innovation um, when really what we're witnessing and John eloquently described earlier as a monetary um, uh, revolution, a monetary um, uh, advancement. And as the market becomes more aware that this is a, a monetary competition and Bitcoin has the best monetary properties and will win out in the long run, I think, despite the fact that thousands of new coins are being released year in and year out, and I think now daily due to the ease with which people can spin up meme coins i'm not sure if you guys caught it but the uh the one woman who is famous for walking and telling the the world about the bet she's going to make on particular sports games uh had the solana community create a meme coin with her likeness um and within days it pumped she started talking about it it dumped and she feels like her career uh has been ruined um a little tangent there but it's just indicative of the ease with which these altcoins can be spun up today. And I think the market is going to realize that that Bitcoin is what really stands out. It is realizing it. And I guess that gets into the broader question of what do you guys think um, from our seat uh, being focused on Bitcoin, the, the market of generalist crypto VC versus our strategy is going to look like over the next three, five, 10 years. Yeah, I mean, you you uh, said it really well. I I really like that point. Um, just to dwell on it for for one second, uh, because one of the typical kind of early stage one on one level objections that you hear uh, again from people who are just kind of first doing their homework on Bitcoin is, well, you know, why can't it be copied, right? Like, why can't the uh, the code's open source? Why can't I, you know, fork it, make my own, and now I've got John Arnold coin or Marty Bent coin or, or Grant coin? And the answer is you can, and they have, you know, that's been done thousands of times and, and you know, tens of thousands of times and at an accelerating pace and even, and the economic value accruing to any of those is borderline zero in Bitcoin terms. Meanwhile, despite constant copying and, and constant attempts to um, 
often with with great operating budgets, you know, behind them of new coins coming out and marketing themselves as Bitcoin 2.0 or the or the Bitcoin killer, often um, backed by Marty, to your point, large kind of crypto VCs or even just generalist VCs. Um, Bitcoin sitting at a one point four trillion dollar market cap. It's being discussed as a tr strategic reserve asset. Uh, it's it's being owned in size by large uh, investors who are looking to hedge themselves or are looking to gain um, exposure to the secular growth story, whatever the case may be. And virtually everything else has has trended to zero in Bitcoin terms and the things that that haven't are kind of well on their way, um, more or less. And so, you know, I think it's 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 good for people to as they're considering the space as they're considering dipping a toe in allocating whether that's to bitcoin uh, itself versus other altcoins or kind of a bitcoin fund versus crypto funds the the economic mass has gone only one way for the last 15 years of, of bitcoin's existence despite it being open source and leaderless and having no marketing budget behind it and so to, to me that's what you're highlighting is kind of the ultimate answer to well why can't it be copied and you know why why should i think it has any you know durability relative to some new competitor that that could come around um over a longer time horizon. And the, the longer that this continues, the longer Bitcoin continues to maintain and grow that economic mass, the bigger its network effect gets, the more people come onto the network and, and hold it as um, a long-term store of value and as, as their monetary asset, the harder and harder it gets for any competitor to, to come onto the scene and, and disrupt that since money is ultimately a network good. And so I, I think it uh, you know, bears repeating and, and bears understanding by anyone who's looking at the space. And to your point on Bitcoin VCs versus crypto VCs, you know, ask yourself where kind of the long term 10, 20 year economic value is, is actually going to build up and accrue. Um, and so I think to that point, uh, to, to get back to your original question, and Grant, you can hop in here too, but I think more and more kind of crypto VC is likely to, um, you know, raise, raise smaller funds, uh, probably not persist as long. Um, you've got a lot of funds that uh, have been raised over the last five years, the last five to 10 years, they'll have to kind of stick it out for kind of as long as the, you know, the fund duration, you know, the fund life. Um, but I, I don't, personally see us getting back to anything like the the highs that we saw for kind of broader crypto VC in, in the 2020, 2021 cycle. Um, and I think more and more kind of broad generalist crypto VCs will look at Bitcoin, what's being built on it. And specifically, most interestingly, I think what you might call the financialization of Bitcoin, but I think what we call internally, like the Bitcoinization of finance, Bitcoin getting inserted more and more into um, traditional capital markets, the, the $500 trillion of, of capital markets that are out there, these, these deep liquid pools that many of which have no access yet uh, to, to Bitcoin, but over time can be made to leverage Bitcoin in different ways. To me, that seems like where um, you know, most people will ultimately have to run if they they want to build up strategies kind of in this space. And so it's uh, personally would, would would short crypto and crypto VCs and long Bitcoin and Bitcoin VCs is, is ultimately my answer to that. Well said. I mean, I think I agree with all that. I think the challenge is um, if we think that some of these just crypto oriented um, strategies have been temporary in nature like how do you how do you predict the death of that or like the the timing of the necessary pivot that they have to make i don't know um it's hard to argue with the fact that some of these firms have made tremendous amounts of money um but it comes with a tremendous amount of risk because like i look at it as very much all you know like a zero-sum play like they there's the, there's um, early allocations to crypto tokens. If they're able to time it right and dump it on, you know, the next investor, which has often been retail, um, then they're winning. But someone else eventually is losing. You're playing with a very risky uh, strategy there. On top of the fact that you know the regulatory landscape, I think, will become even more challenging for going down that path. But I find it hard to predict like when this, you know, crazy, more speculative driven strategies actually makes a shift, uh, because I do think in part, it's somewhat a flaw of human nature. Um, but the interesting thing, like where I think there is some signal is you can talk to people who are, um, you know, not as far on the end of the spectrum as we are about 
um, an exclusive focus on Bitcoin, some that are more agnostic or open minded to, you know, other, you know, other crypto projects. And I would say there's generally unanimous consensus that Bitcoin is not going away, that they believe, you know, they might have a specific view on, on another token, but there's a general unanimous belief that Bitcoin is here to stay. And most people also agree that we are still really early in terms of the adoption of Bitcoin. I don't know what that is. Is it 1%? Is it less? Um, it's somewhere in that order of magnitude. And if that's the case, undoubtedly we are in the very early stages of a growth market. And like the way that I sort of apply um, some of my prior history, you know, when we were, when I was um, at CVC, uh, you know, we did a lot of um, diligence work with Bain on the just consulting side, uh, who would do commercial diligence, would do industry diligence. Um, and we'd, uh, you know, we'd underwrite uh, different markets and try to come up with a view for each company and industry that we were looking at. What is the long term secular growth of this market? And Bain had a really interesting um, set up, you know, this wasn't Bain Capital Private Equity, it wasn't Bain Ventures, uh, the venture capital arm, it was a consulting arm, but they had the ability to co invest with other private equity sponsors, which they would do on a very selective basis. And, you know, they had segregated fund that was available to do that. And over time, they were collecting a ton of data on what were the real drivers of fund performance and outperformance, at least across the co-investments they did. And I remember, you know, at the time they had made something like 100, 150 co-investments and then done a deep statistical analysis on what are the factors that really drive performance. And interestingly enough, um, there were a number of factors that they basically concluded had no correlation to return. Um, and some of them were pretty surprising. Um, one of them was just having market leadership. So if you're investing in an industry uh, and investing in the company leader of that space, that actually didn't have any correlation to return. They also said that uh, cost reduction, so investing in a company and then driving significant cost reduction, which is uh, a strategy that a lot of private equities employ, um, had no correlation to return. And then the other one was having a low entry multiple or low entry price, uh, which uh, interestingly, also, they concluded to not have correlation to return. The most important factors to return uh, that they found, what they called their home run uh, success factors, one was um, investing in a growth market. So are you picking a market that actually has growth? That's the most important factor uh, for driving a home run investment. The second one is the possibility of there being a strategic exit. So are you investing in a company that uh, has the potential to uh, sell to a strategic acquirer? And then the third one, uh, and this one is probably not too surprising, but it's the management team. Uh, so some of those sound quite obvious. Some of them maybe are surprising, but I think the way that you apply them to this space is that there seems to be consensus that we are in the very early stages of a growth market in Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin adoption, uh, which we believe implies further growth of Bitcoin infrastructure. Um, and that's the most important factor, according at least to, you know, these anecdotes that I got out of um, interacting with Bain uh, back in the day. And we think, you know, from a strategic exit point of view, a lot of the companies that we're investing in are effectively going to become uh, potential targets from a lot of the incumbent players that are going to be forced to adopt or adapt to a world that is increasingly moving towards Bitcoin. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, one of my favorite um, uh, Buffett quotes. And I was uh, I, I know that a lot of people in the Bitcoin community don't have a lot of love for, for Buffett and Munger, given they weren't uh, huge fans, to say the least, of Bitcoin, which uh, personally breaks my heart as someone who learned a lot from them. But not everyone can be right all the time. Um, but one of my favorite Buffett quotes uh, is, you know, it doesn't matter how hard you row, it matters which boat you get in. 
And I think when people are over the next decade, two decades, both individuals and, and institutions and enterprises kind of sizing up how and where they want to allocate capital, I think that's a question they'll increasingly be asking themselves and will need to ask themselves as they look at um, you know, Bitcoin versus everything else, not just not just crypto, but literally anything in the world that they can invest in other than Bitcoin. Um, and to, to your point, Grant, you know, investing in getting in in the boat, the the top boat, um, you're putting that tailwind at your back um, just as a force multiplier for uh, the the effort that you put in and gives you so much more leverage on any you know amount of capital invested or or effort that you expend. And I think. Marty, to come back to your original question, that's that's another way to frame it is just you can, you know, look at the investable opportunity and kind of ask, like, do you want to try to pick the the best meme coin fund that is is going to find, you know, the the one the one needle in a haystack, you know, one out of ten thousand that can give you a ten thousand X in in three months while basically everything else kind of in that in that market goes to zero? Or do you want to invest behind um Th this emerging nascent store of value that has monetized from zero to well over a trillion dollars in just 15 years um, with, you know, recovered to new all time highs from four separate 80 percent drawdowns, 99.99 percent of time, despite being decentralized and having no leader transferring trillions of dollars of value permissionlessly around the world in seconds every year or, you know, once once every 10 minutes. Um, every year. And I think ultimately people are going to have to ask themselves that question, like wh which of these is the better boat to kind of get into broadly to allocate my capital to. And, you know, again, to, to bring it back to our thesis, it's, it's pretty apparent to us that it's, that it's Bitcoin and the technologies and, and financial services and products being built on top of and with it and, and around it. Yeah, and with all that being said, getting to the deal that we wanted to dive into this week, it's interesting. It's the bridge deal, Stripe uh, acquiring bridge, <clears throat> excuse me, which is a company focused on basically connecting stable coins and making it easy for individuals and companies to accept and use stable coins, which is an interesting niche part of this broader crypto market, which funnily enough seems to be the only product market fit um, uh, with staying power within broader crypto is just essentially tokenizing US dollars, putting them on these centralized blockchains and having them be able to be sent around the world, um, quote unquote, permissionlessly um, with ease and at, at low cost. And um, despite the fact that we think uh, stable coins certainly have a lot of success and they are a growing part of the market, I think long term, they are noise. Again, as we described Earlier uh, in the show, like the dollar has a, a systemic problem where the people controlling it uh, have basically no other option but to continue expanding the monetary base and debasing the dollar, um, which overall erodes purchasing power in the long run. But for the um, for for the benefit of the audience and our industry more broadly, if we're being honest with ourselves, this was a really interesting deal because I've, as we know, the last couple of years not only um, in the world that we live in, but broader VC more generally, um, M&A activity, IPOs uh, have been have been lacking. And that's what a lot of people have been looking for is what's gonna happen. And I think this deal confirms a lot of what you described earlier, Grant, is that incumbents are gonna be faced with the decision, do we build these functionalities into our company or do we simply buy another company that's already built us, built this for us? And this seems to be the case here at Bridge. And I think uh, this deal is really shocking, uh, considering that it, Stripe acquired Bridge at a billion dollar valuation. And then Coindesk, I believe, released uh, uh, an article uh, in the aftermath of the acquisition, basically highlighting that Bridge at the point of ac acquisition had ARR in the range of 10 to 15 million dollars and so the the multiple on this deal is pretty insane and i guess i'll just throw it to you too is this a good signal for the space that we play in the fact that uh, this activity is going on and how are you guys reading this deal yeah, yeah. i mean i can go ahead, go go ahead. ahead yeah go ahead <laughs> so polite um yeah i mean i guess i'll just uh, throw out a, a couple of thoughts um you know i i think it to your point it is 
surprising to see uh, multiple like this, you know, uh, implying anywhere from kind of 70 to 100x revenue. Now, of course, you're probably looking at if, you, if you're doing this deal, you're looking at kind of forward numbers and you likely have some sort of conviction that that's going much higher very quickly. Um, but still, uh, it's we haven't seen uh, a deal this rich in not just this space, but kind of anything outside of like AI uh, for the last couple of years. And so it's it, it's def there's definitely some sticker shock just kind of looking at it. Uh, maybe we can put this in the show notes, but you know, there's there's some good data out there, uh, recent data from, I think it was, it was Galaxy, Alex Thorne at Galaxy kind of highlighting uh, crypto fundraising broadly, still kind of way off peak uh, from 2021. So I, I don't really feel or get the sense that kind of broader fundraising in in that space is is really back and that LPs are kind of chomping at the bit to um to get in perhaps this is uh you know a deal that helps raise some eyebrows and and bring some more checks in but um it, to me it's uh i have a hard time thinking that this portends you know the the beginning of a, of a massive run again for for broader crypto and um even stable coins in general um certainly possible it's it's not our uh it's not our lane exactly, so happy to potentially be wrong on that. But I think it's worth maybe delving into as well, just like, um, and Grant, I can kick it to you and we can you know, talk about it from there. But um, to, Marty, to your point that stable coins have shown kind of the only product market fit, the only kind of durability and staying power within broader crypto outside of Bitcoin, you know, worth asking kind of as we look at a deal like this um what, what is kind of the 10 20 year value of you know mar a market like this of, of of a set of products like this um i'd certainly have my you know my suspicions and, and my questions on it but maybe grant i can stop monopolizing and you can uh, you can jump in on that yeah well i i mean i had a lot of the same thoughts um i mean part of it for sure i think was um look this is a really interesting signal of a strategic player wanting to have a strong position and someone who was building interesting tech. And I definitely agree that um, there's real product market fit in certain parts of the world for stable coins. Um, you know, let's face it, some people, you know, in, in different parts of the world, they just can't stomach the volatility of Bitcoin currently. So have been fleeing um, you know, shitty currencies for less shitty ones. Um, and um, there has been a role for stable coins in that regard. And the fact that there's a very significant strategic transactions like this, the first one of the first things my mind went to was, you know, at some point, this will be, you know, we'll see similar transactions in the Bitcoin world, because there will be companies that realize, okay, you know, I need to have a Bitcoin strategy, or I really want to access uh, a customer base of underlying holders of Bitcoin, or I want um, the technology infrastructure so that I can provide Bitcoin oriented services uh, to my customers. And for any of those potential reasons, I do believe there's going to be a lot of these buy versus build strategies in the Bitcoin space. That is not the only um, strategy that we have for delivering successful investments. I think that there's going to be a number of Bitcoin companies that remain independent, that don't want to sell out to you know, your incumbent legacy players in whatever industry they're operating with and that they have the potential to become industry leaders in their own right. Um, and I think that there'll be the opportunity for a lot of these companies to pursue public markets. We've seen that with a couple of companies in our portfolio. I think there'll be opportunities for Bitcoin companies that establish leadership positions and uh, positive uh, sats flowing, you know, profitable business models to remain private and pursue a dividend oriented model. Um, so I, I think a lot of that, like that was the first thing that I thought as it related to this strategic acquisition, John, to your point, you know, what is, what might this business model, what might this specific, um, 
uh, industry vertical look like in 10 or 20 years? I mean, I, I don't I don't know that this is definitely outside of my lane as well. But I started to think that, you know, in a way, might you see this dynamic that we've seen in developing countries where um, some of them, you know, leapfrog from uh, one technology and fast forward a couple iterations forward, you know, where we've seen certain parts of the world, you skip your landline phone and you go straight to mobile. Might that also be the case once we see Bitcoin adoption really start to take off where, um, you know, the, the, the technology and the infrastructure around stable coins sort of being the interim step. Um, so, you know, I don't know how durable that will be over the long term, but those are the couple of thoughts that, that I had around it. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, you know, to that point, like I, the, you use, you know, this, this word of interim or like, uh, you know, this idea that this is kind of transitionary, uh, intermittent kind of temporary technological kind of hack, of uh, solving a problem. Um, and I think that that's right for now. Um, the question I think, as you deploy capital into, you know, different companies in the space is, you know, especially in kind of a venture construct or, you know, a fund construct, we're, we're trying to think about what happens over the next, you know, five to 10 years. And then, you know, even beyond that as well to inform where, where value you will accrue um, over over our fund life, and so it, to me, it, you know, I, I echo everything you said that the the whole kind of concept of stable coins to us feels very kind of transitionary and, and temporary. And I think it's for me, it was instructive to just kind of look at the the bridge press release that they kind of put out jointly with Stripe, and one uh, particular uh, set of lines kind of caught my eye. So it says. Stripe and Bridge both believe that our increasingly globalized world needs better money. We need money that can move across borders, be freely accessible to anyone in any country, and and can be sent at almost no cost. And so, you know, to to me, to us, like, well, better money, we we agree, we do need that. And Bitcoin is is very clearly you know better money than the dollar. Uh, and so, right away, it's you know questionable to me that um, stablecoins have a kind of a long term path to to beating out Bitcoin by just being kind of tokenized representations of a, a less hard currency than Bitcoin. Um, but there, I mean, there are two like uh, strains of thought at odds kind of within within what this PR says. And the first one to me that's worth noting is like, okay, so we need free, freedom of movement and access. Well, that's where Bitcoin shines, right? It's completely permissionless. Um, you can use it uh, as, as an individual, as an institution, running your own node on cheap consumer hardware. Uh, if you don't want to run your own node, there are other ways to do it that maybe have other trust trade-offs. But, um, you know, no transaction history has been able to you know be censored long term on the bitcoin network and the same is very much not true of, of stable coins right they're they're permissioned they have an issuer often many issuers at play and ultimately they back into access to traditional banking rails somewhere somewhere along the line someone has to be holding treasuries or us dollars um, that allow the the stablecoin peg to actually be maintained or you're or you're running you know a, a terra luna type scheme and we, we saw how how that worked out over um you know a, a couple of years ago and so the freedom of movement and access piece to me is 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 questionable that it really offers that however the second piece this idea that they, they, we need money that can be sent at almost no cost well i think that's that's really the key for what these products are trying to, to solve for right what people really want when they're using stable coins it, it appears to me especially in emerging markets is you know they want low cost transfers of offshore dollars like grant you're totally right uh their their local home currencies are are particularly unstable even far far more so than the dollar we all know that the dollar is kind of the cleanest dirty shirt and so if you want um, a representation of value that is relatively you know quote unquote stable day to day or month to month it doesn't have the the volatility that bitcoin does then and you can't get access to a u.s bank account well it makes sense that you would kind of want um this this transitionary solution something that would give you kind of u.s dollar like access or u.s dollar like kind of value access um, the problem is that the ability to allow those stable coins to be sent at almost no cost, like that, that requirement and optimizing for that is fundamentally at odds with the trade-off balance that makes Bitcoin work, right? That makes it, you know, that gives it the freedom of movement and freedom of access and makes it as scarce as it is. Um, Bitcoin right now has fairly low, low cost transfers and, and very low cost views, the lightning network. Um, over time, I think we, we all believe that Bitcoin's layer one will get a lot more expensive. It'll become, you know, high powered settlement money and we'll find, you know, other scaling solutions, uh, many of which are 
kind of already out there in the wild to make your more consumer type payments work and, and make them cheaper. But the the fact is it can't be, you know, first and foremost optimized for low cost and kind of easy to use like stablecoin because the way that that is achieved is through trust and through permission right um it's through backing into kind of the existing banking and, and financial service rails that um we've already kind of established are ultimately not on a long-term stable path and so you know as we're thinking about the next 10 20 years of value accrual about the way that economic mass accrues and, and where if people put their capital to work. Um, it, I absolutely think like there may be more stablecoin deals to come. And I absolutely think that this has, you know, the solution has prior market fit kind of today. I think as you look forward, the, the question is, you know, what's what's the bigger prize and what has greater likelihood of like long term durability um, th that you can actually build, you know, real real businesses on. And, you know, it, it's it's yet to be seen kind of what happens when a major stable coin um, has its its treasury you know, seized or um, haircut or otherwise shut down by, you know, some bank, uh, some central bank um, in one country or another for one reason or another. Um, you know, if it happened to a sovereign nation like Russia that holds uh, hundreds of that was holding hundreds of billions of dollars in, in U.S. treasuries, and that could be turned off at the flip of a switch, then you know it can happen to your stablecoin. Uh, so I think that that's as you think about building a house on rock versus on sand, that's a, a key question to me. You know, fundamentally going forward with with these types of technologies. Uh, so that's kind of how I, how I view the deal. Yeah, I also think that if I were invested, if I personally were invested in you know, companies like this, I would want to be realizing those investments in the near term versus uh, taking on whatever, you know, I think I think there's just tremendous uncertainty and potential risk around how this industry evolves over the next several years, uh, specifically just in, in the stablecoin world. I mean, how, one question is like, how many different dollar stable coins do we need? I mean, do we need Tether and USDC and uh, Coinbase dollar and PayPal dollar and uh, JP Morgan dollar and BlackRock dollar? I mean, I, I, I think there's a lot of people that now want to participate and there's a lot of different institutions that have uh, varying levels and some of them very significant levels of influence on the direction of uh, U.S. policy. Uh, and so I think for players out there, there's a tremendous amount of stroke of the pen risk, which if you're an investor, I mean, that's not a type of risk that you want to be taking on because that's the type of thing that dramatically shifts a potential outcome of your investment. So I think to be realizing a positive investment return in the space based on at least a belief that, hey, there's there's some growth in the stable coin market right now. I think that's much more palatable than um, taking on longer term duration uh, risk of however this industry might evolve, because I think it could be, you know, significantly changing over, you know, the, the long to at least medium to long term. Yeah, I completely agree with all that. Nothing to add other than I think we found a topic for maybe one of the next episodes, which is timing. It's something we think a lot about here at 1031. And I think it's something that everybody should really be aware of, especially if you're allocating Bitcoin, or allocating money within the Bitcoin space, is that timing is very important, trying to figure out where to allocate dollars and when um, in the space. And maybe that's the next topic we can dive into in a couple of weeks, which is the something that's core to our thesis and me personally is that there's an order of operations to Bitcoin's long-term success and the necessity of particular companies along the way of that journey to, to ultimate success. Um, and, and timing is something that's very important, something that we take very seriously here at 1031. Um, and despite the fact that we see Bitcoin and can envision its end state, uh, Obviously, we are not at the end state and getting to that end state um, means that we have to be very particular and thoughtful around timing of allocations and what the market is demanding at any given point in time and, and how certain companies meet that demand. Timing for stable coins seems to be right. I think it's inarguable that there is demand for it. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, um, wouldn't be surprised to see kind of more deals in in this vein. Um, it's interesting, you know, that the number is, and this isn't to, you know, um, demean the, the deal at all, more just interesting from kind of an outsider's headline perspective, you know, it's, it's about a, a billion dollar deal, right? And uh, part of that's probably related to, you know, how early stage it is and, um, you know, how, how low the today's kind of ARR is, but, but you would, you would think, you know, if, if this is kind of the future of, of money, the future of finance and, and whether that's kind of stable coins themselves or something like, you know, bridges issuance API that grant to your point allows, um, different holders, different users to kind of issue and then kind of use their own, um, stable coins, you know, interoperably quote unquote interoperably, um, that feels like it's, it's a market that should be bigger you know, big enough to, to warrant much more than, um, you know, a billion dollar deal. No idea what went on with, with the deal dynamics and no comment on that. But, um, I think it's, it's an interesting point you bring up that if, if you're in kind of the, the stable coin space, um, maybe now is the time to just go ahead and, and monetize, um, rather than continue to take on longer duration, um, risk on, on what may happen in, in just a few years, depending on how different administrations here or, or abroad kind of view the growth of, you know, this, this, uh, offshore dollar market. And so, um, yeah, I just think maybe that's something to chew on is just kind of the, the size of the deal, um, relative to, you know, what, what it might've been if it, um, if, if stable coins were, were truly kind of going to become in the next five to 10 years, the, you know, the future of the world's financial infrastructure. Yeah. And to that point, John, I wouldn't be surprised if the stroke of the pen risk that Grant described earlier come, comes from Europe instead of the U S because stable coins are directly encroaching on the Euro dollar market, which, uh, the European economy and the financial system over there has depended on and, um, rode that wave for, for quite some time. And so, um, I think the U S is actually happy that these stable coin markets exist. I think explicitly Paul Ryan has come out many others. You have Howard Lutnick from Cantor Fitzgerald essentially campaigning, for tether like stable coins because they drive demand for for u.s treasury auctions and so i, I would not be surprised if europe becomes the the antagonist in this um stroke of a pen risk that exists for stable coins as we head forward that was yeah it. no doubt yeah guys this was a good first episode i mean the 99 percent of podcasts that ever start don't make it past the first episode so if we get to number two it's 90 percent never get past the first episode uh 95 percent never get past 10 episodes so if we get to two we're in the top 10 percent of podcasts that ever exist if we get to 10 top five percent so we just got to get to 10 and uh I, th I think we'll we'll deem this a, a massive success this was a great first dry run we officially ripped the band-aid off we're gonna develop a rapport maybe we'll be um we'll get more emotion into it as of the first one that we're doing it's always it's always a, a feeling out stage the first few episodes but I, I feel like we're already getting into a good groove here we got a nice uh ping pong action here today we yeah we, we we know each other pretty well so i think uh maybe we'll continue to show a little more of the, the organic rapport as we go forward yeah and to add to that it's not always just going to be us three we do have um we we are going to get guests from within the 1031 portfolio, the 1031 network, outside the network, um, we've got a few in mind um, that, we'll, that we'll have on in, in the coming months and can add to this conversation. Because um, to the point that uh, was made a few minutes ago about duration risk with stable coins, I think that's where I want to go next is timing. And we'll have this discussion when we record the podcast, but I think timing for Bitcoin embedded in long duration credit products as super collateral is um, is going to be something that's talked about a lot this cycle. And I think that is an example of a product where the timing is ripe. Yep. Yeah, agreed with that. And one of the things I want to um, give listeners and viewers out of this podcast is a peek under the hood with, you know, as we have these guests, some of them will be people that we're backing and really give a peek under the hood on, um, you know, 
how we think about a partnership, what it's like to build a Bitcoin business. There's a lot of people who make the rounds on podcast and, you know, talk about their companies on the surface level. I think we have a really unique perspective to be able to, to go deeper on some of those businesses and the stories behind some of those founders and how they're building their businesses and how they think about um, positioning themselves for the long term in this transition that we're talking about. And I think if we can bring that to life, um, that'll be something that uh, is differentiated. Yeah, when, when you said that, it's, it's like we're bringing the tribe to the rest of the world, the 1031 tribe, which is another thing we, we think differentiates us here is uh, open communication lines between us, the founders, founders, LPs, LPs, us. It's a, uh, we, and that's another topic that we can get into is um, how applying the ethos of Bitcoin as this interoperable network driven by proof of work to what we do at 1031 has actually benefited us massively um, over the first five years of the, of the fund. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, I think people will see as, as we go forward, especially when we talk to founders, you know, we're more proud of our founder relationships and some of the, um, companies we've been able to bring into the fold, um, than, than anything else that we've done, just, just having these relationships and, and being in many cases able to be kind of the exclusive backers of a lot of these great businesses. And I think people will see, you know, as we, as we bring them on kind of one by one, you know, the, the proof will be in the pudding, of just how, you know, special 1031 is and, and why we're so bullish about what we're doing. Oh yeah. I, mean, I think I found an ending for it. That was your Bitcoin alpha for the week. We'll see you guys in a couple of weeks.